Good morning, Church. Many people struggle with the truth that God can forgive them of their sin. For them, their sin is so great that it is impossible for God to forgive them. Then we have people who are followers of Jesus and have sinned and cannot accept that Jesus will forgive them of their willful sin when they already knew better. Of course, believers and unbelievers alike struggle with forgiving themselves, never mind receiving and accepting the forgiveness that comes from God. The master of deception, the devil, of course has many people wondering whether they have committed the unforgivable sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So today I want to focus on God as a forgiving God. What is forgiveness? What is the basis on which God does forgive? And how do we receive this forgiveness? Of course, before we can speak about forgiveness, we need to speak about sin. For you to seek and receive the Lord's forgiveness, you must acknowledge that you are a sinner who has sinned and offended the very person of God. This acknowledgement of sin against God is only possible when someone comes under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. In fact, forgiveness is only relevant to the sinner who recognizes their own status before the living God. Many reject the idea that they are sinners in need of forgiveness, in need of rescuing from God's judgment, in need of redemption and of a life that can be in God's presence forever. Actually, in our current world, the very concept of forgiveness in any form of any kind is under threat. The social justice warriors, the social justice movement, has no room for forgiveness in their world. And of course, they live as if there is no God at all. And therefore, they have no need of forgiveness themselves. Their arrogance and self-righteousness actually knows no bounds. So the very idea of forgiveness from the Lord is not a popular thought in our world today. What is forgiveness? In particular, what does it mean to be forgiven by the Lord? Scripture has several ways of conveying the meaning of forgiveness. The most common is the metaphor of economic or financial debt. You have incurred the debt that you are not able to repay and the creditor releases you from any obligation to pay back that debt. That is forgiveness. Another metaphor is a legal or judicial one. You have committed an offence which deserves punishment, but the offender is released, set free from receiving the punishment. Again, that freedom from receiving the, due, the punishment due to you is forgiveness. There are other metaphors that also occur in scripture, like forgiveness being understood as an object that must be carried away or removed from where it is found. Or the metaphor where sin and forgiveness is seen as a blemish that must be covered up, or a stain that must be cleansed, or a disease that must be healed. All these function as images of forgiveness. A well-known example of one of these images is seen in Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. So the common aspects to all these various images of forgiveness is the concept of release or freedom, freedom from punishment, freedom from the debt. That then brings us back to acknowledging one's sin. In a judicial sense, Forgiveness is necessary because all people are guilty before God. Forgiveness then deals with the release, the removal, the setting free of guilt. With the influence of psychology, the aspect of forgiveness as the removal of guilt has probably been the major focus of Christian preaching for a few hundred years now. If you came to faith in Christ later on in your life and you had some kind of conversion experience, 
you would be able to testify to the experience of receiving forgiveness because of being freed of the guilt of your own sin. I remember when I came to faith in Christ, for those first few weeks after coming to faith in Christ, the exhilaration, the freedom, the knowledge of being forgiven, that there is nothing that is held against me by God any longer, was so freeing, was so liberating, and was so exciting. Because of the judicial connection with guilt, forgiveness is often collapsed in with the teaching on justification by faith. And that's quite understandable. We often kind of blend those two concepts together. But if we have to ask what is it that we need to be released from or freed from, then the clear answer to that is the offense of your sin and the guilt of your sin. We have to acknowledge that we have a debt of sin which we are unable to pay God back on. Our need is for God to remove our sin from us altogether. This is what forgiveness is from the Lord. It is the complete release of your sin. It is the complete release of your guilt. A very important point we need to consider and which we have to comprehend is that forgiveness does not come without any consequences. If we stick with the metaphor of debt, financial debt, when you are released from your debt, that money is still owed. It is just being paid by someone else. If we follow the judicial or legal metaphor, the same thing applies. You may have an offense, but it doesn't go away. It is just borne by someone other than yourself. When we apply that same thought in relation to our sin, for which the biblical penalty or judgment is death, then for us to be forgiven means that someone else will have to bear that judgment. And it is for this reason that the New Testament links forgiveness of sins with the death of Jesus. In Ephesians 1 verse 7, the Apostle Paul says, In him we have redemption through his blood. And there is the reference to Jesus' death on the cross. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Similarly, the Apostle Paul in Colossians 1 verses 13 and 14 says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood. So for God to be able to forgive you of your sin means that someone else has to bear the penalty on your behalf. That someone to do that for you is Jesus of Nazareth the Son of God. The time and place where Jesus takes on your judgment so that you can be forgiven is at the cross of Calvary. When Jesus is crucified, he takes upon himself the judgment due to you so that you can be forgiven. This is clearly stated by the Apostle Paul in Colossians 2, verses 13 and 14. And I'm just going to read parts of those verses, not the full verses. And you being dead in your trespasses, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, and he has taken it out the way, having nailed it to the cross. This is why as Christians we speak of Jesus as dying in our place, or for us, or on our behalf. The reason is that the penalty for our sin does not disappear. It has to be borne by someone else, if not us. And that is why Jesus dies on our behalf. Jesus dies on the cross so that we can be forgiven all of our sins. In fact, Jesus himself said that to the two disciples that he speaks and engages after his resurrection on the Emmaus Road. He says the following to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. 
So we see that the death and resurrection of Jesus as the Christ is a necessity for there to be forgiveness of sins. In fact, Jesus tells the Emmaus Road disciples that this had to happen because it was written. The scriptures foretold it. The scriptures required it to happen. This was always going to be the way God would deal with sin and remove it forever. Most significantly, when Jesus celebrates the Passover meal with his disciples on the night in which he is arrested, he says the following. When it came to sharing the cup, he said, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Jesus understands his impending death as the establishment of a new covenant between God and his people. An essential element of this new covenant is the forgiveness of sins. Yet Jesus is drawing on the promise of a new covenant found in the book of Jeremiah. To the people of Israel and Judah in exile who were so desperate to receive forgiveness from the Lord, Jeremiah the prophet said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So here we have a number of new covenant promises, one of which is the forgiveness of sins which Jesus says he is fulfilling as he prepares to go to the cross. In fact, the blood that establishes that new covenant is the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. And because there is this establishment of a new covenant, there is now a new way of receiving forgiveness of sins by coming to the one who died for your sins, namely Jesus. The Apostle Peter, who was brought before the council in Jerusalem, declared to the, the Sanhedrin, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has highly exalted to his right hand to be prince and saviour, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So how does God forgive sins? He does so through Jesus, the Christ, who is our representative, bore in himself the judgment for sin that was due to all people. To receive this forgiveness, you have to come to Jesus in faith. The only way that you can receive this forgiveness is by believing that the death of Jesus pays the penalty for your sin and that God can forgive you, set you free, release you from the power of sin, death, and the devil. To receive the promise of the new covenant forgiveness of sins, you must believe in Jesus. When the Apostle Paul appeared before King Agrippa on trial, the Apostle Paul shares with King Agrippa how Jesus spoke to him and says that Jesus said the following to him, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance amongst those who are sanctified by faith in me. So forgiveness of sin is received by putting your faith and trust in Jesus as the Christ, as the one who can rescue you from God's judgment and it will deliver you into the everlasting kingdom of God. What is the scope of this forgiveness from the Lord? Is there any sin that will not be forgiven? The answer to that question is that there is only one sin that is unforgivable, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells us that in the Gospels, and I'll be reading from Matthew 12, where Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Now it's a, a troubling text and we get caught up in the blasphemy of the Spirit. What does that mean, etc.? But 
we overlook the magnitude of what Jesus is saying. All sin, all other sin, every conceivable kind of sin, except for the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, is forgivable. So take a moment and imagine the worst kind of sin that you can that can come into your mind. Maybe pedophilia or murder or rape. I know there are children watching, so I don't want to mention too many ghastly things that we we do as human beings. But whatever it may come to your mind, all that sin is forgivable. Do you have a sin that you believe is unforgivable? Unless it is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, then you can confess that sin and cry to the Lord in the name of Jesus, and you will be forgiven. This is truly remarkable. The scope of God's forgiveness is just amazing. By that one sin, the grace and mercy of God will extend forgiveness for any sin because of the cross of Christ. Another remarkable aspect of God's forgiveness through the cross of Christ is that it is a one-time event that is applicable for all of human history, past, present and future. In Hebrews 10 we see the following. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. There is no other sacrifice that is necessary to earn forgiveness. There is no other way or means to obtain forgiveness. There is nothing else you can do to come to God and say, Lord, please forgive me. What must I do to earn your forgiveness? The answer will be nothing. Forgiveness is exclusive to Jesus. His sacrifice, his offering of his life is a once for all, for all time kind of sacrifice that offers the, and provides the forgiveness of sins. In his first letter, the Apostle Peter also makes this very clear. When he says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. So the wonderful truth is that your sin is forgivable and it is applicable to all people for all time. That is how unique the death of Jesus on the cross at Calvary is. This means that there is forgiveness for your past. It means there is forgiveness for your present. There is forgiveness for any sin you may commit in your future. As followers of Jesus, we still sin. What about that sin? The Apostle John addresses this issue when he writes to believers in his first letter. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There are three important things to note from this passage. First, it is still only the blood of Jesus that is applicable to be able to achieve forgiveness of sins. Second, it requires confession to God and acknowledgement that you have sinned against him. Awareness of your sin is an important aspect in gaining victory over that sin. Confession is part of the process of coming to grips with that sin so that you can repent of it, change the way you think about what you are doing and how it actually offends God. Third, there is the assurance that God will not only forgive you of that sin, but that he will be at work within you to cleanse you from that sin. He has an incredible truth. Forgiveness leads to transformation into the image of Christ. So we have covered several basic and essential aspects of the Lord forgiving sins. Today you may be in need of the Lord's forgiveness for something in your past. 
or you may be in need of forgiveness from something that you are currently engaged in. Or you may never have come to Jesus and you are aware that you need forgiveness and the salvation that Jesus offers. Whatever your need for forgiveness may be, the death of Jesus on the cross is able to meet that need for forgiveness and you can receive the promise of forgiveness through confession and faith in Christ. If all of this is familiar to you, then you may express gratitude and thanksgiving to God for the amazing forgiveness you have received in Christ Jesus. Whatever your circumstances may be, this thing I want you to know today, you can speak to Jesus, you can speak to God the Father, and you can call on God, the forgiving God, to forgive you. And when you do so in the name of Jesus, by putting your faith and trust in that which Jesus has accomplished for you, and you receive that forgiveness, your life can be different. Your life can be changed. Your life can be transformed. There is no need to remain in a state of unforgiveness in relation to God. You can call on Him. You can come to Him. You can know that whatever that sin might be, you confess it. He is faithful and just to forgive you. I know that many people refuse to accept and receive the forgiveness that God offers in Christ Jesus. I want you to think about that refusal for a moment. When you refuse to accept and receive the forgiveness that God offers you in Christ, you are making yourself greater than God. You are telling the Creator God, God Almighty, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you are saying to Him, I am greater, I am better than you. I know better. Think about the arrogance. Think about the pride and the self-righteousness of that kind of thinking. May you repent of that and call on the name of the Lord Jesus and receive and accept with gratitude the forgiveness that there is and the kind of forgiveness that we have only in the forgiving God because of the cross of Christ. Let us pray together the prayer for the week. Forgiving God, you are kind and good, gracious and patient, merciful and loving. We need your forgiveness. Remind us of our constant need for your freeing forgiveness. We confess our sins before you and ask that you would forgive us. We believe your new covenant promise of the forgiveness of sins, established through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. For whatever reason we may call upon you, you meet us at our place of need. We ask that we might live life purposefully as a people forgiven, so that we might be able to impact our world with your grace and love. In the spirit of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we pray. Amen. Have a blessed week ahead. May you know the forgiveness of the forgiving God fulfilled through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, knowing that you can receive that forgiveness through faith and confession.